generally interested in uh, uh, measuring natural selection at the genetic level and understanding how it varies across space and time, particularly in the context of climate change. So climate change uh, has already shaped the uh, geographic distribution of many species, plants and animals. We've seen patterns such as a net migration or gain of populations in the northern or colder areas or geographic distributions, as well as an overall shrinkage in geographic distributions of many species. Many people think that species are, uh, populations are lost rather fast in the warm edge of the distributions. So we can think of, uh, of climate change as a new natural selection force or a moving natural selection force that is pushing species to migrate or adapt. And as evolutionary geneticists, we can try to understand this new natural selection force at the genetic level to see if perhaps some populations might be able to adapt. They have the right genetic variants, genetic variants that might be uh, adapting or increase fitness under the new environment. So this, oops, I think there's something missing there. Well, the three questions that I want to address today is, is natural selection, uh, can we measure natural selection at the genetic level uh, in multiple environments? How does that vary across environments? And finally, uh, is that predictable? The species that I'm using to address those three questions is Arabidopsis thaliana, which I think is a very useful model for the three main reasons. First, is it uh, has an annual life cycle, so we can actually measure fitness in the whole life, in, the, in a whole generation of a genotype in a given environment, very precisely. The second is that it already lives in very extreme environments. These are pictures of Arabidopsis uh, flowering under the snow and in a uh, sandbank. So there might be genotypes that already have alleles that could be adapted under the new uh, extreme environments. And most importantly, uh, we have a collection of over 1,000 populations with uh, seed stocks and whole genome sequences available uh, for these populations. And I'm going to focus today mostly in uh, Western Europe, which is the native range, the range of Arabidopsis. So the first question that I'm going to address is how much do island frequencies change in response to climate change, uh, climate driven natural selection? To address that, I conducted uh, common garden experiments in two geographic locations. One in uh, the center of the distribution, Germany, and another in the warm edge of the distribution, which is supposed to be an extreme environment. And I did that planting 500 lines out of this 1,000 uh, genome project. And we did this for a single year under these foil tunnels that were replicated in both locations. So this is how it looked in its location. The tunnels were open, so temperature could vary, but we supplemented half of all the replicates with uh, Spanish rainfall and the other half with the German rain, so high rainfall. Total it was 25,000 pots, again, and 500 natural lines for which we have a whole genome sequence. So in these experiments, I measured lifetime fitness, both survival and the number of seeds Per genotype. So here we have uh, the histograms of fitness in Spain, in Germany, high and low rainfall. So uh, together with genomes, I'm going to address now uh, what is the, uh, how can we measure natural selection at the genetic level. So for that, I used a genome-wide association approach, but instead of the traits like flowering time or height, I used uh, relative fitness. <coughs> what that gives us is a proxy of natural selection, what we call total <coughs> selection coefficients. And I re really recommend a Sachs paper on a discussion about that. So essentially, the coefficients that we're measuring uh, directly tell us whether an allele, if we would resow these populations, uh, all these individuals, uh, uh, again the next year, whether alleles will increase or would decrease in frequency. 
So in the x-axis, we have all the positions in the genome that we analyze 1.5 million, and in the y-axis, the strength of that association or the significance of the total selection coefficient. And at a glance, uh, the first thing that you can see is that natural selection or fitness in the wild is highly polygenic, as we see many pigs. Uh, uh, these are the top snips in red. Second take home is that natural selection was much stronger in Spain than in Germany. So uh, there were many more top SNPs, but also the projected frequency changes that we expect in those two locations are uh, for the top SNPs from 10 to 20 percent in Spain and one order of magnitude less in Germany. So we've learned that at the warm edge of the distribution, the magnitude of natural selection driven by climate is much stronger. Now the second question was, does selection vary across environments or uh, in other words, are the same genetic variants or alleles the ones selected at each environment? So to address that, I bring you this plot that I think is very telling. We have one dot, one allele in the genome, 1.5 million. And in the X and Y axis, we have the environment of origin. We know this because we can come back to the natural lines that we use in our experiment, to the geographic locations, and use world claim to characterize the average precipitation where an allele is found nowadays. And in colors, we have whether they were positively in green or negatively selected uh, in red in Spain. And what we see is that alleles that come from low precipitation areas were positively selected in Spain, that is also a, a low precipitation area. This is a signature of local adaptation at the genetic level. What it means is that uh, environments that are dry have already been selected for alleles that are adaptive or that are linked to adaptive uh, variants. <coughs> now, the other question is, are the alleles selected in Spain uh, the ones uh, positively or negatively selected in Germany? And here we have a negative relationship uh, between selection in, in Spain and in Germany. What we see is that it is much more likely that if an allele was positively selected in Spain, it was negatively selected in Germany. So this brings me to the last question. If from the environmental distribution where we found an allele, right, because of this signature of past local adaptation, uh, we see that they're going to be locally, uh, sorry, selected for in that environment, we could also predict that they're going to be positively selected in similar environments and negatively selected in away environments. So can, can we predict natural selection? To address that, I aim to build a, a formal model that would try to predict the total selection coefficients, that is the output from G1, from the climate of origin of, of the allele and the climate at the experimental site. So we can intuitively imagine that if the climate at the experimental site matches the climate of the allele, then there will be a positive selection coefficient. We can also add a number of background information about the alleles in the genome, such as if they're in the gene or high diversity region, etc. And uh, this model was fitted with a regression decision tree and with random forest approach, machine learning approach, that is going to learn all these relationships and their interactions. So to test whether there was predictability, I took a cross-validation approach. I hid part of the data train the model in the other part of the data and repredict that hidden part of the data. Long story short, doing bootstraps and a number of other checks, uh, I saw that there was a predictability between 30 and 50 percent. That does not overlap with zero. And even longer story shorter, I tried to cross-validate with external environments. So I downloaded data from other people that had conducted Arabidopsis experiments in similar situations as ours, uh, downloaded they, their data, take the climate from those locations, from world claim, and predict uh, what uh, natural selection should be. And we also saw that there was predictability. So now that we have a predictive model, essentially, that has been trained in multiple spatial locations with varying strengths of selection, can we use future predictions of climate change to see how that selection is going to change? 
So I downloaded data from the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, took our uh, trained quantitative model with natural selection, and predicted what should be the alleles in the genome if we repeated the experiment in 500 locations where we've sampled our oxygen. <laughs> that is the first sign. And then, <laughs> then I uh, looked at the genomes of all the Arabidopsis where we had predicted what allele should be selected for and counted whether the right allele was present. What this tells us is that in all these red areas, the alleles that are present locally will be negatively selected in the future, in projections to 2050. In white and uh, green areas, uh, they should be okay. And what this is telling us is that there is a new wave of a lower precipitation moving towards Europe that is causing a change, a shift in natural selection. Interestingly, an observation that we found afterwards was that the areas where selection was most intense also coincided with areas where there was a higher interannual precipitation variation, which means that not the intensity or the extreme environments were also more variable. And as some of the theory predicts, those areas also had a higher diversity in the local genomes and a lower non-synonymous to synonymous ratio, so meaning that selection was more efficient. So moving towards the future, I think when we make predictions under climate change, we not only have to take the fact that climate is a, a changing in natural uh, selection, a directional change, but also that climate toxicity is increasing. So probably we will have to account for this temporal dynamics. And this is exactly what we're planning to do in the future. We've designed experiments to track temporal dynamics. This is a project of a large-scale evolution experiment conducted in 45 locations for uh, three years or more, starting in 2018, and we're going to track changes in climate and changes uh, in the genetic composition of the population using evolved <laughs> sequence. And with that, I want to thank everybody uh, that helped me in these projects and Shameless Plug. I'm starting a lab, so if you're interested in these things, uh, ping me. <laughs>